Let's open our Bibles together to 1 Thessalonians. We're in chapter 5. We're continuing our series and uh, moving towards a conclusion. Today we're going to look at verses 12 through 14. As you open up your Bibles and get settled in for the study, I'd remind you that, as mentioned, we do have our baptism tonight, and uh, I invite you to be part of it. We're going to have an evening service. It begins at 5 o'clock. I'll be sharing some things related to baptism, but I am giving you an actual study. There will be a study, not simply a few words about baptism. There'll be a study, worship and a study. Then we're going to go out to the pool, and uh, we'll be performing the baptism. Um, You will notice that some will be kept under the water a lot longer than others. (laughs) That's because I know them. And some may not make it out. And so that'll... (laughs) So tonight, we'll have our baptism. On Wednesday, we pick up and continue our series in the book of Proverbs. We'll be looking, I believe, at chapter 29 this upcoming Wednesday night. Invite you to be with us. And uh, fellas, we do have our men's breakfast next Saturday. We have a combined men's breakfast, meaning that we'll be joining with some of the men from Calvary Chapel Upland as well as Calvary Chapel Ontario. Uh, Randy Walls from Upland and Mike Ursioli from from Ontario. Both were assistants to me here and uh, went out and planted their churches, both of them planting their churches over 20 years ago. And so I thought it would be nice to get two of the fellows together, have a breakfast with some of their men and our men combined, and have uh, three, three teachings. We should be concluded before noon or around noon. And so I invite you to be part of that. And if you're going to have the breakfast, we need you to Purchase your breakfast tickets before you leave because we have to make our order tomorrow and they need a count. And so if you plan on being with us and uh, having breakfast with us, which is a good breakfast, then I I invite you to go and buy your uh, breakfast before you leave so that we can order the amount of uh, breakfast tomorrow and and it'll all be prepared. So today we're in 1 Thessalonians 5. We're going to look at verses 12 through 14 as we continue our series. And uh, I wanted to kind of pose the question and, and somewhat answer the question, what is a church? Because I believe that there's a need today in our society to once again understand what a church actually is. And Paul is uh, giving to us some insight in, into what a church is here in these verses. And so let's read verses 12 through 14, and we'll get into our study this morning. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. Paul writes, we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now, we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient. With all. Now, I want to develop something for you here. We're going to develop a foundation, a context, because we need a context to view these scriptures through. We need to have a foundation that we can apply to this so that we, we understand what Paul is saying and how that pertains to the church there in Thessalonica. You see, what he's doing here in verses 12 following is actually closing with instructions concerning what has been called life in the church. And the instructions are intended to encourage this church to be strengthened, especially in their community. Now, in our day, this is something that is very important for us to remember. It's important to remember that the church is a community, a community of like-minded believers. We need to remember that church is not simply a location and certainly not simply a building. And that's something that I think that uh, many have forgotten today. Uh, As I survey the church... I see that, that many uh, believers are, aren't even settled into what they would call their home fellowship. There are those who refer to multiple places as their home, but they're their home church for certain days or certain nights. For example, if you say, what is your home church? They'll say, well, my home church is, and they'll mention something, a church that I go to on Sunday morning. But then my other home church is where I go on Sunday night, and then I have a a third home church that I go to in the midweek. Or I may have a combination of churches that I call my home church. I just go on the internet and 
I like a certain church's style of worship, and so I enjoy the worship with them. And then I go to another page, and I, and I hear the teaching. And so we kind of like create churches to our own liking. And that's taking place today quite, quite a bit. There seems to be a restlessness. There seems to be, in many people, a, a, a constant search for something that's new, something that's different. It, it's a mindset that you actually see uh, portrayed by the Athenians uh, there in the book of Acts in chapter 17, verse 21. It was a mindset of certain Athenian philosophers. It says in Acts 17, 21, all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And that's kind of like what's happening right now in the church. They're looking for some new thing. There are those who question whether it's necessary or even possible to have what would be called a, a home church. Others wonder if it's even necessary to attend church services at all. You see, the thought of going to church services isn't part of their spiritual quest. And they ask the question, do we have to go to church in order to be saved? Well, let me answer that quickly. The answer to that, obviously, is no. Church membership is not the same as being a Christian. There are many believers who desire to be in a church service, but they can't attend. There are those who are in isolated locations. Perhaps they're in the military. They're on a mission. They're incarcerated. They're incapable of actually leaving and, and attending a, a church service with other believers. Uh, there are others who are dealing with conditions that make it difficult for them to be around people. They watch online. And by the way, there are some right now watching online, and we welcome you. We love you. And we would love to have you with us, but we understand that. This is no judgment on you. There are those who are physically ill. They're unable to attend, but they would if they could. There are cancer patients who can't be around people because of their treatment, who, who would love to be here, but they can't. There are those with other kinds of physical illnesses. They do watch online. My mom uh, broke her back uh, and never got out of the bed that she was, she was on for the last year of her life. And I have a, a picture of my mom. It's one of my favorite pictures of her. And she's in her bed, and she's got a little stand next to her, and she has her um, computer, and she was watching church services online, and she's got a little hand up because my mom was one of these energetic types who would just pump her fist, and, and I could almost hear her. She's watching me as I'm teaching, and my sister took a picture of my mom with her hand up and me on the screen, and I can almost hear my mom saying, shut up, David, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> I could almost hear it. But my mom would have loved to have been in church services had she been able to. She would have attended. So when it's possible to be part of a local group of believers, that is something that you should do. It's where it is made possible for you to use your spiritual gifts, to pray, to serve, to have fellowship, to be accountable, to receive communion, to receive baptism. It's a community. The church is a family. Interestingly enough, the church, the word church, never speaks in the scriptures of a building. It doesn't speak of a special place that people would meet. The word church in the Greek is ekklesia. It's used around 49 times in the New Testament. The word ecclesia literally means the called out ones. It would be speaking of a congregation. It would be speaking of an assembly and very often would refer to a synagogue. And so the church is really called, is really spoken of as the called out ones, the ecclesia. In, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the apostle tells us what we're called out of. Because if you're called out ones, you must be called out of something. And so in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, he says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we have been taken out of spiritual darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's Son. When you read your Bible, theologically, the word church can be used in various ways. 
The word church refers to all believers who have ever lived and those who are now in heaven. And in that capacity, that would be referred to in systematic theology as the church triumphant. You also have what is referred to as the church universal. The church universal speaks of all genuine believers throughout the world. Paul refers to it in this way in 1 Corinthians 12 when he says in verses 12 through 14, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up only one body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free, but we have all been baptized into Christ's body by one spirit, and we have all received the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. It's the church universal, people throughout the world, made up of many parts. It's also called the church militant. It's referred to as the church militant because we engage in spiritual warfare. There used to be well-known hymns that were sung in the church uh, about being God's soldiers, God's army. And, uh, and that's because it was a recognition that we're engaged in warfare, spiritual warfare. We fight against sin, the world system. We wage warfare against the devil. In 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, the apostle said, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You're talking about spiritual warfare and the enemies on the prowl to destroy. You also have what is called the church visible, which refers to a visible community. It speaks of members of churches often attending and serving in a church, but in the church visible, not everyone is a believer, though people may think that they are. In, in services just like this and throughout the world, there are people who are, are there amongst the congregation, that, and that's why it's referred to as the church visible. But then you have what is called the church invisible. And the church invisible is the genuine believer. They, were the one, they are the ones who are in the church visible but are known by God as genuine like it says in 2 Timothy 2.19, the Lord knows those who are his. Or what Jesus said in John 10.14, I'm the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and am known by my own. You know, before I was a Christian, I did go to church. I sat in church services. I wasn't a Christian. I would have been looked at theologically as being part of the church visible. But those around me who were believers in Christ, known to God as his, who follow Jesus, they are the church invisible. And so you see that the church is spoken of in a variety of ways throughout Scripture. So in the New Testament, the church, the word church, can also be used to re refer to believers who meet in a certain location, and that is referring to what is called the church local. Now, I said church local on purpose. It's actually the local church, but I was afraid I'd say the local church and <laughs> insult a bunch of locos. But the local church or the church local, you see it in, in Scripture, Acts 11.22, speaks of the church in Jerusalem. If you read the book of Romans or First and Second Corinthians, the book of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, or Colossians, you look at First and Second Thessalonians, First Timothy, Philemon, Hebrews, James, Third John, the book of Revelation, they all mention that the church was meeting in certain cities or locations, the church of Corinth, the church of Rome, the church of Ephesus or Philippi. Well, the church can meet in local areas. But the question, what is a church, is important in order to understand what Paul is saying. A church is made up of believers in Jesus Christ, been born again, who regularly meet to worship God through Jesus. The church is a community that will proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The church worships Jesus, sings praise to him, gives thanks to him. The church are those who are taught God's word through devotions as well as in studies and services. The church celebrates baptism and celebrates communion together. The church recognizes the need of and respect the role of spiritual leaders in the fellowship. And the church serves one another, financially supports the work that is performed for the Lord. 
And that is where there's confusion and a growing weakness with the body of Christ because Christianity has become fragmented, individualized, and depersonalized. We all know the term, Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior. And that is a term that has come through, uh, through up to us historically through a variety of means, including uh, through Billy Graham's uh, wonderful ministry where he would speak about receiving Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And, and in his ministry, as well as the ministry of many others who use that term, it was intended to communicate that it's not enough for a person to attend a location, but they need to have a relationship with God through Christ. It's not enough to be water baptized and say, thus I am a Christian. That's, that's not what made you a Christian. So you need to have an individual personal faith in Christ. And that's why Billy Graham would say that we need Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. He was simply emphasizing the fact that we needed to have a relationship with God through Christ on an individual basis. Unfortunately, what has happened is people have said, well, that's my personal faith, and thus I don't need other people, and that's simply not true. And that has caused a fragmentation of the church, and the church has become almost selfishly individualized. It certainly is depersonalized. Paul does say that we need a, a relationship with Christ but we also need to remember that faith is lived out in a sometimes messy community. I mean, let's face it. You got saved and you're entered into a, a, a group of people who are still in process. None of us have fully arrived. It's a messy community. You know, I was born into a family. I was raised in a family. And, and frankly, uh, my mom and my dad had four kids and and they didn't ask me permission to have the other three. They didn't. They didn't say, you know, um, would you mind if uh, we went on to have a couple more kids, a couple sisters, you know, because I would have vetoed that idea. I would have said, no, and you can get rid of my big brother while you're at it, you know. <laughs> you know, they didn't ask me permission to add to the family. I didn't select those who were part of my family. I didn't select them. I didn't have the choice. They simply were born into it. And, and this church, as you look around, this group of people who believe in Christ, you know, you didn't necessarily choose the person next to you or in front of you or behind you. You didn't say necessarily, that's the one that I want. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But God chose them, and they're your family. They, they belong to you, and, and, uh, and, and you belong to them. And, and that's what we need to begin to understand in this day, is we actually really do need one another we need to understand that the church is a gathering of like-minded believers, believers who, who love Jesus Christ and who are learning to love one another. We need to understand that. And, and by the way, this loving one another is like the song that you sing, we are known by, uh, by our love. Christians are known by their love. Well, that's the mark of a believer. And, and, and the loving of one another is what makes us different than any other organization. You can be on a baseball team. You don't have to love your fellow uh, baseball players, a softball team, football team. You don't have to love your fellow uh, athletes at all. You're part of a team, but it doesn't require that you love one another. You can be in a fraternal organization or a sorority, if you will, and you don't necessarily have to love your fraternity brothers or sor sorority sisters. You don't have to in order to be part of that organization. You can be a, in a lodge and a variety of other organizations. And There's no requirement. You don't sign up and say, I will love these people. You don't have to do that. But to be a believer requires that you love one another. That's what Jesus said. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one for another. And so love is what makes the church what it's supposed to be. It's what makes us a community. It's what makes us a family in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and this family meets at various times in various locations. We can have large meetings on Sundays or a Wednesday, we can meet in people's homes or community centers for that matter. We can meet together on a resort, a beach, or a backyard because church isn't an event. It's a family that gets together and knows one another. The Apostle John wrote five of the New Testament books. In 3 John verse 14, he wrote, I hope to see you shortly and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. 
In other words, we know each other. We see each other. He didn't say, you know, prophetically text one another, you know, instant message one another. He said, greet them face to face by name. There's this reality of the need to be with other human beings. The one thing that God says in the beginning of Scripture, the first thing that he says is not good, is that the man should be alone. We were not created for isolation. We were created for community. And we need to understand that. It's interesting when Paul closes the book of Romans, and you look at his last chapter of the book of Romans, he mentions around 36 people in that chapter by name. So that helps us to understand the importance of being part of a church fellowship because of the relationship you can have one with another, the relationship that you're supposed to have as people. It is not a good thing for the church to become isolated from one another. We need one another. As uncomfortable as I can be, and I do get uncomfortable sometimes when I'm being squeezed somewhere, you know, by people I don't really know. As uncomfortable as that can be, I also realize that that's very human, and that's a great need that I have. I need to be around other people, human beings. I don't want the isolation. I need the accountability, the relational things that go on when I'm with the church family. And so Paul is speaking concerning what a church is and, and church life. And, and that brings us to verse 12. As he here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 says, We urge you, brethren to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and goes on to say, be at peace among yourselves. So verse 12, notice how he says, we urge you brethren. That word brethren in the Greek language is adelphus. The word adelphus literally speaks of being born from the same womb. So he's saying, you are the church. The church is the family of God. You are brethren. Again, we need to understand that today. He emphasizes this some 17 times in this letter, seven times in the last chapter alone. Each member of the body of Christ is not only an individual. Each member is a family member. And families need leadership. And God-ordained leadership is needed in the church. And this leadership is to be valued by the church which is what he is now emphasizing. Notice again in verse 12 here, he says, we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you. We urge you. He urges them because our natural tendency is to take people for granted. We also have a tendency of being suspicious of any spiritual authority that may be placed over us. And that's easily understood in light of how one person's failure can impact so many people. It only takes one failed church leader to undermine thousands of faithful people. Just one. All it takes is one pastor to, to, to do something that is printed and it goes national. And before you know it, people from every state in the United States is aware of what that man has done. It undermines uh, credibility in a terrible way. One person's failure can impact many people. But the fact is, it is also easy to fail to appreciate those who have given so much. It's, it's not that we're not thankful, but often it's something we simply take for granted. There is an attitude that we Americans have, an attitude of consumerism, and it can exist in the church. We can have expectations of ministry and, and forget the work that goes into the ministry. So Paul writes, we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you. Now, in what way are they to recognize those who labor among them? Well, they're to acknowledge them first as messengers of Christ and the gospel. Acknowledge them as genuine shepherds and realize that they are, they are entrusted with God's word. Now, he had already pointed that out in chapter 2 and verse 9 when he had said, you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. In the same chapter, verse 13, he went on to say, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because 
When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. And so he is regarded, he's saying you regard them as those who've been entrusted with God's word. It's like what 1 Peter 1.25 says, the word of God endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Now, why are you to regard them? Well, he had always stated in, in chapter 2, verse 4, that they had been tested and, and, and have been approved, and they have been entrusted. And so those who have been faithful should be honored. He's saying, treat them with love and treat them with respect for their work's sake. Well, someone says, why? Why should we do that? What's the big deal anyway? Why should I do that? If we show them too much attention, won't they get proud and won't they get arrogant? If we show them that we care about them, won't they take us for granted and use us? Why should we do that? Well, if that were the case, then Paul would not command us to respect and honor them. The fact is, they do what they do because they love you and they care for you in the Lord. Ultimately, the leaders of the congregation give an account of their ministry, not just to people, but to God. In Hebrews 13, 17, the writer said, Obey your leaders, submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. So the writer gives two reasons for them to be obedient to spiritual leadership. One, he said, leaders watch over your souls. When he says the leaders watch over your soul, that speaks of their spiritual oversight. The word watch over, it speaks of being sleepless or being awake, to be on watch, to be attentive or ready. He's saying that their leaders lose sleep over them. Their concern for them is so great. Leaders love them deeply, exercise great concern for them, and even protect them. And that's the heart of a shepherd. But he also said in Hebrews 13, 17, that leaders give an account for their care for God's sheep. You see, James chapter 3, verse 1 says, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Spiritual leaders aren't perfect, nor infallible, and people obviously will disagree with them. Yet, the attitude God desires is sincere appreciation for the leadership of the church. He says, let them do so with joy and not with grief. When members of the church refuse to obey and disrespect their leaders, it is painful. And the work of ministry ceases being a joy. It becomes a burden. It's filled with grief. Through obedience and submission, they give their shepherds a great joy in their heart, and that should provide them with the motivation to live properly for the Lord. Somebody once said, you'll never find a happy pastor apart from a happy congregation. And so, he says, respect them. Recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Now, when he speaks of labor, Recognize those who labor. Labor speaks of growing weary or tired, exhausted with toil, burdens, as well as grief. You see, ministry very often is hard work. It's physically tiring and it's emotionally tiring. Ministers labor long hours, grow very tired as they labor. Now, long hours, well, that can be difficult. But long hours are not unlike any other work in terms of hours. The true difficulty of ministry is that the labor being performed is spiritual. And the minister works on something that is never finished in his lifetime. I mean, you can go out and you can be a contractor. You can be a construction worker. You may be building a home and all. And you, you have your plans and everything. You lay the foundations. You go and you begin to do work on it. Eventually, you build a house. And, and you're through building the house or whatever it is that you're building. You walk away and you say it's done. But ministry is never through. Ministry is not ever over. Ministry continues through the lifetime of that minister. 
And, and that minister will, will minister through the Word of God and prayer in order that he might build up the body of Christ. And, and as he labors, his work is opposed every step of the way by the enemy. You see, Satan desires to undermine God's work in a person's life. And that, that minister does get tired. He does undergo attacks. He, he does get maligned, and he's often second-guessed. He's injured. He's taken for granted. He can be threatened. He can be stalked. He can be criticized for his messages. He receives hate mail. He endures his children being judged. He's mocked for the way that he speaks. His wife can be harassed. The board can tell him he's not worth his salary. He can have his staff undermine him. People casually disrespect him. In today's church, people comment on what he drives, where he lives, how he dresses, how he looks, his temperament, the way he ministers, all of that's under close scrutiny, and he can get tired. He can get tired. And the minister labors, and, he, and not only is he drained physically, but he's also drained emotionally. Often they're not appreciated, and often they're unloved by those that they love the most. In 2 Corinthians 12, 15, Paul said it like this. He said, I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I'm loved. And so the minister's greatest desire is to see the church mature in their love and faith in Christ. Galatians 4, 19, my little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Or 3 John 4, where John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And that's why we bathe the church in prayer, and that's why we do our best to teach the word. So because of this work, they're to be respected, treated properly. In 1 Timothy 5, 17, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. And he says in verse 12 again, they're to be esteemed because they're over you in the Lord. The word over you means to care for, to protect. They guard you. They love you. They lay their lives down for you. There are ministers who have been given authority that comes from God. They use it for the well-being of the church. And he goes on to say, and they admonish you. When he says they admonish, that word admonish means to warn or rebuke. Elders are there to love the sheep. But elders don't get the roles confused. An elder remembers what the role is that they have in the church. And that allows them to correct someone when necessary. The lines haven't been crossed. My own pastor's name is Chuck Smith. And Pastor Chuck was my pastor for many years. And I got close to him. I, I spent time with him. I served on a board with him. I traveled with him, went to Israel with him. I taught at pastor's conferences, men's conferences, went on on uh, ministry cruises with him. I spent a lot of time with my pastor, got to know him fairly well. And, uh, and uh, he was very important to me. I loved him very deeply, and his memory still is very deeply embedded in my heart and soul. I, I loved my pastor very, very much. And, and all, and I got, as I said, I got fairly close to him. And um, I, I still remember him saying, you know, and I was speaking to him on one occasion, you know, he said, I like to be called Chuck, but I always called him pastor. I never called him pastor. Uh, I never called him Chuck without the name pastor or the title pastor before. I, and I, I remember when my father died, uh, prior to my father dying, I had approached Chuck at a conference and I had spoken to him and I had said to him, uh, pastor, I said, I want you to know God has been good to me. He gave to me my father, and he gave to me you. I said, I have the best of both worlds. I have a pastor that I love as a father, and I have my own father that has been a great man in my life. And, and then my father died, and when my father died, I was at a pastor's conference, and I was seated next to Pastor Chuck, and I turned to him, and I was speaking to him, and I said to him, I said, you know, Pastor, I said, uh, the Lord took my dad to be home with him. My dad's at home with the Lord now, I said, but I still have you. You're still my father. You're taking the place of my dad. I mean, that's how deeply I love this man, Pastor Chuck. I got close to him, but I still remember on one occasion I was speaking to him, and he said something to me, and I said, yeah, man. And when I said, yeah, man, to him, he looked at me like, you know, he did not like that. He did not like that. I, I thought, man, I thought we were friends. Give me five. You know, no, he didn't like that. You know, you know, I crossed the line without realizing it. I didn't know it. And I, I, I mean, I wish I could have drawn back those words. Yeah, man, but I learned my lesson. 
And I, I realized, you know, that as close as I could be to this man, he, he deserved my respect. And, and that's how it, how it works in ministry. And so elders, elders know who they are. You see, one of the problems that churches sometimes have is when the elders forget that they're spiritual leaders and they try to become like the people in the church in the sense of saying, oh, yeah, I do that, I say that, and I'm this way, and all of that. And they can lose the respect of, of the sheep. And I, and I think that's not a good thing at all. You know, sometimes there are those who want to be so close to the sheep that they fail to realize that the sheep doesn't need a buddy the sheep needs a pastor. The sheep doesn't need another friend. The sheep needs somebody that can be spiritual leader in their life. And, and though that pastor may love them in a friendly way, and we do, we have friends in the, in the church we love very much, we have coffee with and we visit with, I never forget who I am. I know who I am. I'm, I am not just my name, David Rosales. I am the pastor of the church and the pastor of that man across from me or that woman I'm speaking to. I know who I am. And I'm not going to be somebody's buddy. I'm going to be somebody's pastor. I will be the friend in the sense that I can be, but I always remember who I am. I want to retain the respect of that person. Because I, you know this, it's true, that people will love their, their, their shepherd when they start seeing things about them that they think are much like them. Sometimes they can lose respect for them. Now, I don't put things on. I'm not pretending to be holy in front of you. That's not one of my problems, to be honest with you. I just am who I am, but I at the same time know what I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to be. I'm the pastor of this church. I'm not, I'm not somebody who bounces around, plays around, teases and things like that in weird ways. I know I'm supposed to be because at any given moment, somebody may need a prayer. Somebody may need a, a scripture. Somebody may need an ear to hear. Somebody may need somebody to cry with them or to laugh with them. That's what they need. They don't need a buddy. They don't need a pal. And the elders need to remember that. Spiritual leaders need to remember who they are. And because they sometimes have to admonish, as he's saying here. And again, that means to warn or to rebuke. We need to remember so that we may have to correct and do so. And the lines have not been crossed. He says in verse 13, esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Esteem them very highly. Love them very deeply because of their spiritual work among you. Don't take them for granted. Value them. And then he moves on, and he says, and be at peace among yourselves. Be at peace among yourselves. Division will always undermine effective ministry. Division is one of the basic tools that Satan uses to undermine works. In Matthew 12, 25, Jesus said, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself will not stand. So unity in the Lord is to be pursued and guarded. Ephesians 4, 3 says, We're to be endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so that's something that we work for and work at. We need to remain at peace amongst ourselves. And because of this, he moves into verse 14 and says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. So he gives four orders here in verse 14 to the elders. This is intended to safeguard the unity and the peace in the church. One, warn those who are unruly. The word unruly uh, is a word that was used in Greek society concerning those who wouldn't show up for work. It would also be used of soldiers who are out of rank. And so what he's saying, there are those who are unruly. There are lazy soldiers who are not pulling their weight. So he says, warn them, encourage them, exhort them. They need to pull their own weight. It's not right for somebody else to do things that they could be doing. It's not right for somebody to be exercising their spiritual gifts when this person's not exercising theirs. We're, we're a body of Christ. We should be working together. So encourage them. In Galatians 5.13, for you brethren have been called to liberty. Only don't use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Then he says, comfort the faint-hearted. These are those who think that the, the enemy is too great. There's no way we're going to make it. The enemy is just, is, is, he's going he's gonna to win. So he's saying, remind them. Remind them. Remind them. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Remind them. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Remind them. 
God has given to us power from heaven, the ability to do that which he has called us to do. He didn't give to me a command that he doesn't give me the power to, to obey. Command them, remain strong, don't be timid, you can do it. Don't give up hope, hold fast, don't let go. God is on the throne. He's not going to leave you hanging. He's with you. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. He will be with you. You will have victory in Christ because he gives it to you. Remind them, the battle is the Lord's. You can fight your own battle if you want, or you can have somebody on your side who has never lost a battle. Choose who you will have fight your battles and trust him in it because the Lord doesn't lose In Romans 8, 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Remember that the battle is the Lord's great problems, gives God great opportunities. He shows himself strong. If I did not trust the Lord to do what he knew, I knew he could do, if I didn't trust him to do that, I'd still be in a home somewhere in Norwalk doing a home Bible study for six people. But I know God is able I know God is capable. I know God can do abundantly above all I ask or think. All I need to do is get on the same page with him and begin to move in his spirit. And then I get to see him as he unveils himself step by step, victory after victory. And I see God glorified. So hold fast. Don't let go. He's there for you. He's there for you. You also uphold or support the weak. You strengthen the spiritually weak. You do so by the word. You do so by, by, by love. You, you have fellowship with them. I, I've been given the opportunity in September to go to Colorado to speak at a, a regional Calvary Chapel pastors conference. And the assignment that has been given to those who are going to be teaching relates to endurance. And uh, my dear friend, uh, Randy Walls, and his wife, Jeanette, uh, are my wife, Marie, and my closest friends. And we spent a week, just this last week together, I took a week off, and and we spent uh, time together. And I was sharing with them uh, about the assignment, and it relates to endurance. And I said, you know, I'd like to talk to you about it a little bit, and it's something I can share briefly with you. I said, it's something I'd like to ask you guys about. I said, because the assignment that we have is to speak on endurance. And I said, and there's so many things that you can say concerning that. I mean, just look at this church, 37 years, that's a model of endurance. My, my ministry has been going since 1973. That's a model of endurance. People have asked, what has kept you strong? How do you continue to minister over you know, one decade, over another decade, over another decade, into another decade? Uh, how, how, do, how have you ministered for 45 years? And remained faithful. How? And so I have ideas of that, of course. The Lord gives you strength in this and that. But as I was speaking to them, I said, you know what it is? And I want to share this with you. This is important. I hope it makes sense. And I, and I do so trying to be as real as I can. And There have been many times when I have I've just said, I can't do this anymore. Somebody once asked, um, have you ever quit the ministry? And I said, yeah, every Sunday. <laughs> but there are times that, 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 that people who are not in pastoral ministry, that it's just not something you can understand any more than, than I can understand. If you're a police officer, I don't understand your job. I don't know what you go through. Uh, I can never understand a housewife or uh, a a woman in any way. Can I understand a woman? (laughs) Such knowledge is far beyond me. You know what I mean, though? I I don't understand many things, and and I would never expect that you would be able to jump into my skin and say, oh, I get it, because you don't. But I can say this, that there have been many times in my ministry. Again, I started teaching in September of 1973. That's when I began my ministry, 1973. Every week, Bible study after Bible study, thousands of Bible studies, thousands of hours of study, and you multiply that over the years. And, and, and I've had people who have approached me and said things to me, like, I hate you. I, I remember a woman approaching me after a Bible study, and she said, I hate you. I just can't figure out why. And I'm looking at her and saying, honey, we'll talk at home. No, uh, (laughs) 
<laughs> Not in front of the people. No, she says, I hate you, and I, can't, I don't understand why. She says, I, she says, either it's because I have sexual attraction for you. She said it in front of my wife. I mean, because I have sexual attraction for you, or I hate authority. I said, you hate authority. There's no doubt in my mind. Your problem is a hatred of authority. I mean, I have had some of the strangest things said to me after Bible studies that you can't imagine. Some of the strangest things about my clothing, about my shoes, about whether I... I mean, it is amazing what people are seeing and not listening to. That's just people, right? And there are times that you're going through pain that nobody would understand. A child who's going wrong. A sorrow in your heart that's so deep that you can't speak. And you want to give up. And you want to give up. It's not that God isn't good. It's that you think you're not. There's something wrong with me. Why? What have I done, Lord? And I've gone through so many things. Not the, yes, this isn't a sob story. I'm trying to be real. It's just, that happens, right? And I was talking to my friend, Randy, and I said, Randy, what has kept me strong all over these years is my God is able. My God works in me. I know that, but it's you and Jeanette and friends like you that have held my hands up in times when I couldn't hold them up myself. Paul says, comfort the weak. Guess what? Sometimes I'm weak too. And sometimes I need someone who will put their arm around my shoulder and say, you'll be all right. God's with you. We'll see this through together. Listen, if you don't have a friend, pray that God gives you one. I have friends that have helped me through the valley of the shadow of death more than once. And I've been in this pulpit, brokenhearted, but you wouldn't know it because I have people praying. Even right now, there are men praying for me as I'm preaching this message. I have support. They comfort me when I'm weak. You can comfort others. I need you. And you need me. Like Barney said, we're all one happy family. <laughs> but we need each other. We need each other. That's real. That's real. Not, that's not the man on the screen, the perfect man who never fails. That's not that man, the Wizard of Oz. We all need each other. God made us fearfully and wonderfully, and we need... See, I have weaknesses you have strengths in and I need your strength and I have strengths that you have weaknesses in and you need mine we need each other I'm not over you I'm with you I'm your brother I love you but I'm also the pastor of this church and I will not ever lower myself to be anything less than that you didn't come for a buddy you came for a pastor I will be that in your life if you want it and I will be that person for you. And we will comfort one another. And finally, he said, be patient with all. You know, in other words, don't give up on the church. Some of us are very difficult to be around. I call them stinkers. And some sheep are stinky little sheep. They're stinkers. And we can be hard. We can be difficult. Who's to say we're not? I mean, come on. If you, if you had a family at all, you know that. If you had uh, more than one brother or sister, you know, you know that. Even dad and mom could be stinkers. I mean, we, we, we can cause each other. Families cause each other problems. That's just a fact. We do. But we don't give up on one another. We hold fast to one another. You can be arguing with your brother, but if somebody steps in, it's like you and your brother now against that guy because this is my brother, you know, and leave us alone. You know, we'll deal with this, and that's how you can be. And I really need the church, and I haven't given up on it. I'm not, why would I? Why would I? Don't give up on the body of Christ. We can be difficult. We can be, but be patient. He says, be patient with all. Hold fast. Trust the Lord. Encourage them. I have seen some people that, I'll be honest with you, I thought, oh, this person, I don't, I don't know. I'll give you one example, and then I'll close. 
Many, many years ago, I, I was teaching a pastor wannabe class, guys who want to learn pastoral ministry. I'm talking 25 plus years, about 25 years ago, at least. And there's a fellow, and I had said at the beginning, I, and I do this periodically, I'll do these classes, and I said at the beginning, listen, if you don't do your homework and, and, and the reading and things, then just, I'm going to release you. I'm not going to have you. A pastor has to be somebody who is actually disciplined to, to do the things that are in front of them. And if I give you an assignment, I'm expecting you to have it done. And this one fellow who was in, in my class uh, wasn't doing his assignments, and there were minor assignments, and, and so he didn't do them, like two or three in a row, and that was it, so... You know, grace goes so far, and then the law. And so, at the end, he walks up, and I said, you know, this is your last day in the class. Why? I said, you don't do your assignments. He says, but I've been busy. I said, so am I. And you don't do your assignments. Well, I know I'm called by God. I said, you may very well be. But I know I'm called by God to be in this class, and that's where you're wrong. You're out. I smiled. I wasn't mean. Get out. No, I, I was nice, but I'm firm. I said, no, you're not in class anymore. But I know I'm called. Well, we'll see. And he, he's the only person that I ever had to say you're no, in, no longer in this class because I'm firm about those things. If you can't do your homework and your assignments, what gives you the idea you can pass through a church? You have to be disciplined, and you have to learn it here. And I'm real firm about that. Well, anyway, he left, and he was hurt. And he moved out of town. And uh, now he pastors a Calvary Chapel ministry. You know, he, he's a pastor in a church now. I failed him. But God didn't. Because it awoke him. It awoke him. I need to be disciplined. I need to learn these things. I need to. And he became the disciplined man he needed to be all along. And so even then, you don't give up on people. You just encourage them to do the right thing and then trust the Lord to work in their lives. And guess what? If that person is sincere, God does a work. If that person wants God, God shows up. He does show up, doesn't he? He does show up. God is there and he, and he doesn't abandon you. So don't, don't give up on the church. In Colossians 3, 12 and 13, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. That's not a suggestion. That's a command. Did Christ forgive you? Yes. Forgive others. Forgive others. Live at peace with all men. And watch what God will do in your life. Don't give up on the church. Hold fast.